I'm just setting it up now, should be, so the meeting's live streaming now. All right, so I believe we are on, we are streaming, we are live, and it's time to start uh, this uh, workshop on test, adjust for, and report publication bias. Before we start, let's um, go through some little housekeeping. Uh, so welcome to the SmartConf 2023 and to this workshop, uh, which I believe is the first workshop. And um, this workshop is on test, adjust for, and report publication bias. Uh, this workshop is being live streamed uh, to YouTube and has a group of uh, participants uh, taking part live. Uh, I mean, a very well, warm welcome to you all uh, again. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for any of us three presenters, because we, we will be talking in terms, uh, you can ask them either through the Twitter account. So you have the, the uh, tag there uh, at ES Hackathon. Uh, for that, you have to comment on the tweet that is specifically for this uh, workshop. So just uh, reply there and create a thread yourself. And then if you register for the workshop, you can ask questions uh, here also in the Q&A &A facility. So down there somewhere, there is a Q&A &A and we'll keep an eye on, on there to, to answer questions. And uh, you can also comment uh, and chat with other participants uh, on the Slack channel. And you should have got a link to that Slack channel in one of the latest emails from the conference. So we will do our best to, to answer your questions. Uh, we will try not to get dizzy um, because yeah, it's like three places where to look at. Um, but if there are some questions that we don't answer now, we will come in back, we will come back to them right after the workshop. And uh, again, if you have any questions later on, you can also contact, uh, contact us. We will put our information there. So. Before we start, please make sure that you have read the Code of, code of Conduct, uh, which is available at the website of SmartCom. Uh, this is very, very important. All right, so let us introduce ourselves. Um, so my name is Alfredo Sanchez Toja. Um, I'm based in uh, Bielefeld University in Germany. I'm an evolutionary ecologist, an ornithologist by training, but by now I consider myself to be 95% reconverted into an evidence synthesis and a meta researcher. And you'll see a, a little bit of a pattern here. Um, would you like to do it or shall I do the presentation? Ah, I can say it. So okay. hello, uh, my name is Małgorzata Lagish. Uh, people call me Losha. So you may see that name somewhere. Uh, I'm evolutionary ecologist and ecotoxicologist by training and surprise, surprise, 98% get converted into press the button, evidence synthesis and meta researcher. Good to see right. you around. Thank you. And last but not least. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jie Feng Yang. Now I'm working at uh, UNSW Sydney. Uh, I was an uh, agriculture engineer, but Chen, but now um, <laughs> I I I ninety five percent reconverted into uh, evidence synthesis and uh, meta research. All right, so the three of us are going to be taking turns for the presentation. I will start with a little presentation on publication bias and some examples are drawn from ecology and evolution, uh, which is my field. That's why it was easier for me to kind of present this part uh, with those examples. I hope uh, that's okay, even if you are from other fields. And then we will move on into uh, um, the presentation from Losia. She's gonna talk about uh, common practices uh, for publication bias test. Later on, your phone will talk about uh, the new method that we are suggesting here that you should all use because we, we believe is, well, it is the strongest uh, and most robust method to test uh, publication bias uh, for the time being, or so we believe. And we will, after so the last part of the of today's workshop is going to be hands on you have to uh, get your hands dirty into how to actually do it and for that we will use uh, r no surprise also given the conference all right so i'll start um I'll, I'll start by talking about publication bias as i said then with some examples from ecology and evolution so if you want to switch off already 
the take home message is that publication bias is commonplace. So you better test for it. And now I'm going to try to convince you why that's the case with a few examples. We are going to talk about two types of publication bias. Uh, one could define more. Uh, these two are rather common. And so it's the Klein effects, also known as a time lag bias, and then small study effects, which uh, often are known as a file, the file drawer problem. And it might be also uh, what you have in mind when you think of publication bias, really. So for the Klein effects, uh, in ecology and evolution, one of the first examples, if not the first, uh, came from this study uh, in, in, in published in the 2000, where the author realized, uh, while looking at uh, studies on uh, testing whether uh, parasites can manipulate the behavior of their host, uh, the author realized that there seemed to be a pattern uh, with effect sizes becoming smaller over time. And this is what you can see here with this R, this correlation coefficient. There is a negative correlation between the mean effect size of these studies that were included in the meta-analysis and the year of publication. And this is precisely what the client's effects are. Um, they can be due to multiple reasons, but the main idea is that we would observe a pattern where effect sizes are becoming smaller uh, over time. So they are approaching zero. And in many cases, it could be that those effect sizes over time become zero. This uh, study was uh, soon followed up by a much bigger study, uh, uh, a more of a meta research study that combined meta analysis uh, from uh, different meta analysis from the field. And as you can see, they also found stronger, well, they also found evidence for this kind of. Uh, um, negative trend. So by looking at 44 meta-analyses, which included more than 200 studies, you, you can see that the correlation was negative between this correlation between effect size and year of publication. Uh, the size of the effect is smaller, but it was still present. And this is not something that was happening in the past, in the 2000s, uh, in the 2000 and 2002. This is something that still happens today. So there are many examples these days uh, where we still find these relationships. So this is one study uh, that comes from my PhD, which I finished a few years ago. And we also found that there was a, a correlation between uh, effect size uh, and, and year of publication precisely for this uh, question, which is a question that you may have even seen on TV because it was a, a feature by one of the BBC documentary narrated by David Attenborough. And in this study, what the, in this uh, in this hypothesis, what we are testing is whether this black uh, patch that the house sparrows, a common bird that you may have seen around, uh, whether this patch reflects or signals the dominant status of the individual. And as you can see, we detected that there is a pattern for effect sizes becoming smaller to the point that in recent years, there seemed to not be strong or any evidence for this hypothesis. And a very good example just published uh, the last year and actually even this year uh, is this one on whether uh, ocean acidification affects the behavior of fish. This is a very particular and interesting uh, study because um, you can clearly see that there is a strong uh, decline in, in the, the size of these effects. And basically the, the effect has become very, very small over time. The interesting bit is that if you extract or exclude uh, effect sizes coming from a couple of labs that seem to be the ones that suggested this hypothesis, what happens is that there is actually no trend, meaning that it seems that the trend is driven by a couple of labs in the world that, that were producing very strong and st statistically significant effects. No surprise, uh, uh, one of the authors of, this, uh, of one of these labs um, wrote a reply to this paper, uh, trying to kind of uh, debate that there is anything wrong there. Uh, but even with the reanalysis that this author uh, did, that uh, you can still see that there is a tendency for effect size, or not a tendency, there is an effect um, for these effect sizes becoming smaller over time. 
And actually, on the reply to the reply, what the what the authors of the original paper are suggesting is that these effect sizes, which are log response ratios, are almost impossibly true. So they've run some randomizations and simulations to show that for these effect sizes to be true, I mean, it's quite uh, difficult. Um, there is some uh, allegations of fraud involved, but long discussion kept short. All right, so that's uh, all about the client effects for the time being. Let's move on to small study effects. So this is really what you may have if you haven't really tested uh, for publication bias or, or you, you haven't heard of it before, this is probably what you have in mind when you think of a, a publication bias. So imagine a funnel plot, a typical funnel plot that you may find in any meta-analysis uh, on the literature where you have on the y-axis the correlation coefficient in this case, uh, it could be another FX size. And on the x-axis, you have a measure of precision. In this case, I use sample size for simplicity. And this is all run uh, simulated data just uh, for the fun of it. So 1,200 FX sizes, a huge meta-analysis. And I simulated a, a mean value of around 0.2 for the correlation coefficient. And small study effects mean that there are certain effects, precisely those of small size, that we do not find for whatever reason in the literature. So when you collect your data, even if the data should look like this, like a perfectly symmetric uh, funnel, and that's why, why this is called funnel plot. When you collect the data, you realize that there seems to be so, some asymmetry in this funnel plot. And precisely the effects that are missing are those that are small in size, and that either are statistically non-significant, or they might even be statistically significant, but against the original hypothesis. And we don't know where, the, where these are. And the idea is that these are somewhere hidden in the file drawer of our research. Uh, so for us to test if there is evidence of these small study effects, we need to try to identify these asymmetries in the funnel plots. And we will talk about this later on. That's what, precisely what we want uh, to, to learn, how to do this uh, in, a, in a robust manner. So some examples, one that I like a lot from ecology and evolution, because it's a a really comprehensive study is this one uh, where the author, and this came in this case, uh, Tim Parker, tries to summarize all what we know about coloration in this wonderful, beautiful bird, the blue tit. And uh, there have been multiple hypotheses suggested for uh, the, the coloration that uh, uh, these uh, birds present, whether they may reflect the age of the individual, whether they might be used for uh, from, um, uh, in sexual selection, so for females to choose males, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the conclusion after this super comprehensive study is that for most of the hypothesis, there is evidence of publication bias. So what we actually really have certainty about this plumage coloration in this species is that males and females are different. That's about it. For the rest, there is a lot of potential for publication bias to be affecting what we think we knew about this, uh, this uh, coloration in birds. Another example that uh, I wanted to highlight uh, is a recent study that we did uh, in, in our lab, uh, led by uh, a master student, now a, a PhD student, where we tried to answer whether uh, the size of uh, males in this uh, a group of species uh, of, of fish uh, would predict the reproductive performance of, of the males. So basically the idea that has been suggested is that um, small males in these species might be the ones getting most of the kids in the population because they are very good at uh, um, yeah, being involved in sneaky copulations. And we wanted to test this. So we collected data from studies that tested this hypothesis precisely, and this is the final plot uh, from these uh, studies that explicitly tested this hypothesis. So again, in the y-axis, we have a correlation coefficient as our uh, FX size, and in the x-axis, for simplicity, we have the study sample size. And as you can see, there seems to be some asymmetry, and when we test it statistically for this asymmetry, which we will show you how to do uh, later again, 
uh, you can see that there is a negative correlation between effect size and study sample size. And this is precisely what is telling us that there seems to be some evidence for small study effects. Because what's happening is, is that the larger the sample size, the smaller the effect. And if what we would like to see, so if we don't want to find publication bias, which is hopefully what, what we all want, that there is no publication bias, is a straight line. That no matter what uh, happens with the sample size, uh, the evidence is the same. That would indicate that the funnel is symmetrical. Uh, a funny thing that we did with this study is that many studies measure the two variables of interest for us, which were the size of the males and their reproductive performance, despite that they are not testing this hypothesis. So what we did is that we located those studies, we tried to get access to their data, either because the, the data was openly available or we contacted authors, and we got a lot of data that way, that in principle, in principle, was never used to test this hypothesis. And then we added it all to our uh, uh, data set. And when we include it and do again the test, this is what we observe. What we observe is that there seems to be still a little bit of a, a, a of an effect uh, of evidence for, for small study effects. So you can see still a trend for effect sizes becoming smaller with sample size. But this trend at least is not statistically significant. I mean, it is there, but it's not that strong anymore. Meaning that by doing this approach of analyzing open data sets and data from uh, authors, it seems that we managed to kind of uh, reduce the impact of small study effects on our conclusions. And well, those are decline effects and small study effects. Uh, uh, those are the two types that we will focus on today. But just keep in mind that you can find evidence of publication bias uh, uh, by doing other type of tests. And just briefly, I wanted to show that in, in this case, for example, you could compare if you have access to um, uh, effect sizes that are published versus those that are unpublished and see if those differ. So in this plot, what you can see is that if we would have based our hypothesis on published effect sizes only, our conclusion would have been stronger. So this is the overall effect with the 95% confidence interval uh, for the published, and this is for the unpublished. Another thing that you may want to keep in mind is whether the, the uh, experiments uh, are blinded. So basically the experimenters are blind to, to the hypothesis, meaning that they do not know which group is the control and which is the uh, experimental. Um, and this has been shown to lead to some inflation of effect sizes. So here you have uh, effect sizes from non-blinded experiments leading to a larger overall effect size than those from blinded experiments. This is, this is something that you can try to test if you find any study that is blinded. That's sometimes a challenge in ecology and evolution. And another example is uh, comparing studies that uh, were fully reported to those that were partially and non-reported. Uh, for this, what we what I mean actually is that this uh, overall effect size is based on uh, effect sizes that we got directly from authors. Yeah, so it's very similar to the published versus unpublished. Uh, but you can also see that for those studies that partially reported uh, uh, effect sizes, so not they did not report all of them, but part of them. There is even a little bit of a tendency for the effect to be stronger, meaning that there might have been some selective reporting that leads to this actual bias and the small, potentially small study effects. And with that, um, I think it's turn for Lucia to go ahead. Let's breathe uh, one minute, uh, one second uh, to, to get some air and refresh. Some nice bubbles. And um, whenever you tell me, Losia, I start uh, taking care of the slides. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, I always find it very impressive, like all this evidence for publication bias in published studies. So I think the question here is do people test for publication bias in their meta analysis? And nowadays we have hundreds of thousands, even meta analysis published in ecology evolution. and few orders of magnitude more in other disciplines. If we take like medicine and psychology, meta-analysis 
is very, very popular there. So we wanted to look, we are ecologists, evolutionary biologists by training. So we wanted to see how often people test for publication bias and uh, what tools from the available tools they use. Uh, so we've conducted a survey which was published uh, yeah, almost two years ago. And I will put a link to the article so you can look at the details and methods there. And also there is an article a uh, correction which just fixes a small mistake in one of the equ equations. So I will put it in the chart. Okay, yeah, so you can see the actual paper. So what we did, we had a data set of uh, over 100 meta-analysis in ecology and evolution, and we surveyed the methods they use for testing publication bias. And let's move to the next slide. And this study was led by Shinichi Nakagawa, and we had lots of good collaboration. There, we look at two types of publication bias that you are already familiar with because Alfredo introduced those. So outcome reporting bias, it's selective reporting, so small study effect. Uh, this is the most commonly known uh, type of publication bias and also time lag bias, you are already familiar. So uh, positive results are published earlier, large and large results, effect sizes are published earlier than the negative or uh, non-significant one. So, okay, let's move on. We still go straight into our results, but if you look at the get arrow, it's non-reported. That means that almost 20% out of 100 meta-analysis did not do any test for publication bias. So they don't know if a data set is potentially biased by small studies effects or uh, time lag bias, okay? And if they don't know, they cannot correct for it either. But the good news is 32% use funnel plots. It's as simplest and most common type of publication bias. The Good thing about this, it's really easy. It's implemented with lots of software. Uh, but think about it, it's quite weak and not very precise and not very effective, especially if you have few studies in your meta-analysis. But still, it's better to use this one than nothing. And uh, we have uh, around 10% using either correlation-based or regression-based methods. So this is a kind of a single group of type of tests. For descriptions, you, I suggest you just look at the paper. We have like nice section for each type of publication by us test describing how it works and what are the uh, benefits and drawbacks of each. Uh, and other common uh, names of publication by us tests that you will see in published meta-analysis is fail-safe number and dream and field test. And uh, yeah, and if you look at yellow arrow, you will see that just 5% of meta analysis tested for time lag bias. Okay, so this is a very visual summary from the paper. On the left side, you have same types of publication bias tests as in the previous slide. Uh, but the columns kind of characterize the test. And if it's uh, yellow, if it's if it's green, it's a good sign, okay, it can do some of the things that are on top. If it's orange, it's not good, okay? So uh, just giving you a preview of what Yefon will be talking next, if you look at the very bottom, you will see multi-level meta-regression, and that's a new, more, uh, new type of test, which is not done by visual inspection of funnel plot. So it's not a type of funnel plot. You need to actually do some stuff, but it's really powerful and it deals with all sorts of weaknesses that other methods may have. And uh, so I think we can move to the next slide before we move to the uh, Yefon's part where he will introduce this new, more powerful method. Oh, something is messed up in this slide. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I think it's just different computer. So I just wanted to give a quick reminder that publication bias tests for small study effect and time lag bias are not the only biases that you can observe in your data. 
uh, and all those biases stem kind of from uh, human psychology and our publishing system. And uh, you can potentially also test for those using methods like Yvonne will be presenting, where you can include moderators in your analysis. And some of moderators can be related to those other biases. If you can extract data, code it, you can include it in your models and try to test for other types of biases. So for example, not just preference for novel surprising or positive results, but also results supporting current consensus uh, for views uh, and results similar to the person doing the test, uh, sexy fashionable topics effects, but also maybe looking at the institutions and type of countries that do the uh, meta-analysis or primary studies, language of the studies, and uh, yeah, ranking of the institutions and all of those. So there's lots of things to explore in the future, lots of other potential biases. So that kind of goes into more bibliometric and other studies, but uh, so this is just an interesting point. And it's time to move to the next section where you need to look at some formulas and learn a new and more powerful method. And first theory, and after that, there will be a practical part of this workshop where you can actually use the R code and try out this new test. Thank you. And maybe 30 seconds of relaxing before we move on. Thank you. Uh, Alfredo, so I want to share my own screen. Okay, mm, uh, hello everyone. So after uh, Alfredo and Lucia's presentations, I think you got a very good impression of what is publication bias, uh, why we need to detect it, and the cardinal practice of detection methods. Now I'm going to take you through a new method that can be used to properly test and adjust for publication bias in your own data set. Uh, you might as oh, sorry, is okay. Uh, my one is here. You might still remember, um, in a Lucha's survey showed that final uh, plot is the most common way to detect the publication bias. Final uh, plot is a very easy way to use and very intuitive. Uh, the principle is uh, if you see symmetry in your final plot, this means your data set is safe, there is no publication bias. But if you see a symmetry as is shown in this panel, in your final plot, this means uh, there might be publication bias in your data set. So you need to interpret your meta-analysis results with caution. Uh, but you might wonder what is symmetry and what is a symmetry? This is, to be honest, this is quite a, a subjective at some point. For a given final plot, some people might think this is symmetry, but others might think this is a symmetry. So what we really need is a more objective way to detect the publication bias. Agas regression or Agas test is uh, this kind of uh, quantitative method that it can be used to statistically test the asymmetry of a final plot. Many people might uh, know this method. Uh, let's recall this a bit. Uh, this is a mathematical rep representation of the Agas regression. In the left hand is the effect size estimate. It, it, the principle is if we regress effect size over the sampling error, we can get the statistical relationship between effect size and the sampling error. That is the slope beta one here. So in your data set, if, you, if your slope beta one is positive and uh, statistically significant, this means your data set might have publication bias because large sample size means a small sample size and the low precision. Some, uh, studies with small sample size and the low precision report larger effects. 
Uh, this means there is a lot, there is a high likelihood of selective reporting, or at least uh, the final plot is asymmetric. Although uh, the accurate regression is intuitive and uh, very common, uh, there are at least three issues to be resolved for this method. Uh, the first issue is if your data set has a high degree of heterogeneity, which is very common in many fields, for example, in ecology evolution, the accurate regression will have a non nominal for superlative rate, that is the um, type one error rate. The second issue is when your data set has a high degree of data non independence, which is also very common in some fields, uh, like environmental sciences and the ecology evolution. Agar regression will not perform nominally. It will have a, a non-nominal type of error rate. The, the third issue is the accurate regression, including all the existing methods, is of low power to detect publication bias. So this means your detection method will have a high degree of false negative rate. So uh, how to resolve the issues? We propose a method to uh, resolve the issues to help properly detect the publication bias. Uh, this formula is the mathematical uh, representation of our method. Uh, left hand again is the effect size. We still regress effect size over the sampling error because this is the only way we can get the relationship between effect size and the sampling error. But meanwhile, we need to account for heterogeneity by including other important uh, covariance or uh, predictors, or some people call it uh, moderate variables. Because uh, uh, as we said, the high degree of heterogeneity can lead to uh, for superlatives. And then we need to organize one uh, multi-level random structure to account for the data non-independence. If your data set uh, has also has the a correlation in sampling errors, you might still need to uh, impute a with, within study variance covariance matrix to account for the correlation in your sampling error. Uh, within this framework, we can get the accurate correlation between effect size and the sampling error to reflect the uh, small study effect. Uh, the elegant, I mean, this solution is very elegant because you can. Uh, detect uh, the other very common form of publication bias, that is the time lag bias, by simply adding the publication year as a predictor. The slope beta 2 can reflect the publication, the relationship uh, between the publication year and the uh, 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 effect size. Uh, but doing so, you can examine whether your evidence is temporarily stable or not. I mean, whether your effect size is declining over time or not. Uh, one point you, uh, it should be noted is that, in essence, the aggregate regression, including our extended aggregate regression, is to uh, investigate the relationship between the effect size and its uh, sampling error. But for some effect size measures, for example, standardized mean differences, SMD, the, if there is an inherent or natural relationship between effect size and its sampling error. So this will cause uh, for superlative because with, if, even though there is no publication bias, there is, there is the uh, existing correlation between effect size and its sampling error. As we can see in this panel, if we keep the sample size constant, if we increase the point estimate of the effect size, the sampling error will increase accordingly. So uh, this will lead to for superlative. So what we can do to resolve this? this. So a simple issue is to um, get rid of the point estimate of the effect size when calculating the sampling variance. Uh, the well, common way is to use the modified measure of sampling error. Uh, the, effective, the effective sample size based sampling error is a very common solution and uh, works very well. I will show you this point in the later hands-on session. By using this uh, method, we investigate the, the publication bias in ecological evolution using a very big data set. Uh, 
this uh, this if you read this paper, you will find the uh, the impact of public energy bios if you neglect it in your data set. Uh, this paper now get published in BMC Biology uh, in a very special publication form. registered the report, uh, which is pretty cool. I think this publication form will be the will be adopted by many publishers in future. Uh, in this registered report, we found that publication bias is very common and persistent across ecology evolution. This is the first uh, uh, very uh, large scale meta research evidence showing that publication bias is a common and a general phenomenon in ecology evolution. So everyone needs to pay enough attention on it to detect it and uh, transparently report it. We also found that uh, publication bias can lead to low power of primary study and uh, the exaggeration of effect size, and even lead to the wrong direction of your effect size estimate. Uh, you might wonder if we find publication bias, uh, what we can do to remedy its impact. Uh, here we provide a solution. Uh, this is a formula which can be used to correct for the publication bias. The parameter of interest here is the intercept. This intercept can be interpreted as the true overall effect of the population level effect after correcting for the publication bias. Or more accurately, you might call it a bias correction effect. The principle is in your data set, if your sample size is big enough, let's say you have an infinite sample size, then the precision is big enough, infinite. So that the sampling error is negligible and even uh, near to zero. Let's say we sent uh, sampling variance here, this term to zero. At the same time, we sent the publication year to zero to account for the time lag bounds and also account for other important uh, uh, predictor variables. Then you will get the intercept. This intercept can be interpreted as the true effect because there is no sampling error. So you will get the true effect. Uh, by using this method, we investigate the uh, impact of the publication about in college evolution. We found that around 24% uh, reduction in the magnitude of effect size after a, uh, correcting for the publication bias. Uh, more amazingly, we found 60% originally statistically significant effect uh, became non-significant. So uh, this is really not a good sign uh, to this field. Uh, but we have to acknowledge uh, our method is uh, is uh, is very general and uh, can be extended to many um, publication bias detection. But uh, it is, uh, also has all uh, disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantages is our paper, including all the existing detection methods, uh, are of low power. The average power of the detection method is uh, around twenty percent. So given the low power of the existing method detect, uh, publication about detecting method, uh, what we need to do is to shift our interpretation philosophy. Uh, conventionally, in our meta-analysis, we will report publication about as uh, by economists way, let's say there is a publication about or there is no publication about. But given the low power, we really need to uh, shift from the statistical significance for cost to more bi biological signi uh, significance for cost. Let's say we need to focus more on the magnitude and the precision of the effects of the publication bias estimate. I will show you how to properly report uh, publishing, publication bias report uh, test results in the latter section. Okay, so Alfredo, should we take a break? And take a few seconds brief before we enter into the world of R. Are there any questions so far? I mean, there were quite a few equations there. Uh, I, I get dizzy myself looking at the questions. Also, I start dizzy looking at three places for questions. But if yeah. you have any questions, perhaps this is uh, we can have a little uh, small break trying to answer them. Yeah. Best, perhaps the Q and A here session, if you can. Otherwise. I'm also checking the tweet there and the Slack. So far, there's nothing there. As far as I can see. Uh, 
right. I do not seem to see anything on Slack or Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wonder, is it time to put link to GitHub to the repo or we do it after presenting the HTML? Mm, yeah, so, that's a good idea, I think. Yeah, let's okay. maybe share it already. Yeah, yeah, so the GitHub repo contains copies of two of the papers we've been talking about, like as PDF files and also a few other things that will be useful and code, yeah. of, of course, and data. Uh, so we can share it already now. You mind taking care of that, Lucia? Yeah, yeah, I will put that it closer. on okay. Slack because yes, I think we cannot, we cannot use chat here. Uh, so I just put in the questions for presenters. Uh, the link is also on the Q&A as a, as a reply to Wolfgang's uh, question. Well, comment. Uh, there is a github.com uh, uh, link that I believe everybody should be able to see. Okay, I'm just putting now the link to GitHub. Okay, it's on. Brilliant. If there are some questions, okay. Wolfgang has a question, we can try to answer, and Carolina. Uh, Wolfgang, um, I guess okay. by extrapolation, you mean that um, it is uh, basically for a hypothetical scenario where the standard error is zero. Um, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, that's already, uh, so the question is, uh, I can read it, I mean, I'm not sure everybody has access. So the intercept is an extrapolation and its standard error can be quite large due to that. Hence, it isn't surprising that one might lose statistical significance when one looks at this. Any comments on this? Um, yeah, so there is a little bit of an assumption when we run these models and we look at the intercept, uh, which is the one that we consider to be the um, effect size adjusted for publication bias. And is that that intercept assumes that the standard error is zero, which is a hypothetical scenario that cannot be. Um, and Wolfgang has a good point that uh, maybe that's also because of the standard error being quite large in that, um, it might not be surprising that that's why we uh, lose this statistical significance. Uh, in my experience so far, I mean, I cannot say from the mathematical point of view, I'm sure Wolfgang, you can say that better, but from my, my experience, uh, it's not also that common that you that the uh, that intercepts uh, loses the statistical significance. So it is often the case that it the, it gets smaller, the the adjusted effect size, but quite often it remains statistical significant, at least uh, significant, at least with the examples that I've used it so far. I don't know if you phone and Lucia had any other comments on that. So in short, I'm not sure I can answer really your question well enough. I'll move on to Carolina's uh, oh. Ah, okay. Okay. Mm. okay, thank you for offering us uh, a busy reply. The next question, probably I, I can explain the next question in the hands-on session because the way we are also go through the formula. It's okay? Yep. Uh, but Wolfgang is saying that uh, many of the examples you showed, you found the, the statistical significance was lost. Um, the in the, in the, yeah, that's true. So 
So I suggest, yeah, we, we answer Carolina's question and Wolfgang's, uh, we can look at it uh, during the tutorial. There's still one question from Peter. Uh, given finite mm -hmm. resources, we need guidance on the best compromise methods. Uh, I am not sure exactly what you mean by that. Uh, what methods are you uh, referring to? Uh, contacting authors and trying to uh, obtain unpublished data plus unreported standard deviations, or what exactly do you mean by that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we face this problem also. It's always a, a trade-off. You have to. There are some practical decisions we have to we have to deal with when we are doing evidence synthesis. I, I, I'm sure it's not uh, something that only happens in ecology and evolution, where resources are comp comparatively low uh, with other fields like perhaps medicine. Um, so yeah, I mean it is a it is a important and difficult issue to deal with, uh, and yeah, as I'm saying, no, we normally have to take some practical decisions based on whether we can do it or not. So if really you have so many authors that you cannot really contact them all to try and recover uh, unreported uh, standard deviations, uh, you're gonna have to give up and do your uh, meta analysis in this case with uh, whatever is reported entirely which is of course a pity and also can lead to some biases, but you can also reflect that in the discussion of your methods. So you can, for example, provide uh, how many uh, missing data uh, or how many, the percentage of uh, studies that uh, do not report data entirely and things like that, and include that information when you are interpreting, interpreting your uh, values, your, your results. It is really a very difficult thing to deal with. So I don't have a clear answer other than, yeah, we do what we can. And as you say, sometimes resources don't allow us to do a perfect job. That's uh, why many times comprehensiveness, even though it is desired, it is, uh, can be a little bit too topic in my opinion. If there are no other questions. Uh... Oh, well, there is another one in the Slack. What kind of bump in sample size would be required to have adequate power to use the modified version of Eggers test? Chiffon, okay. would you like to try to answer that one, please? Yeah, it's, on the Slack. it's on the Slack channel. Is it got to no. I can I can copy it into the into our chat so that you can read yeah, okay, more. Good. Uh, yeah, if you can copy it's it's great. Uh, in the chat so that you have easy access to it. I'm not sure what uh, what Carolina means by bump in sample size. She's writing, or they are you writing. Do you what, kind, what kind of increase in sample size would be required to have adequate power to use the modified version of Eggers test? We, uh, we do not have a very clear cutoff of the number of the sample size you used. Mm. But according to our, so, this is a uh, very picky thing to hand, to deal with uh, because in in terms of the multi level, uh, that, and, I mean version of agar regression, it's hard to say how many uh, sample size you need you used to have enough power to detect the publication bar, uh, publication bars. But uh, the more the better. We do not have a clear cutoff on this.
but in principle, you can use it uh, no matter the sample size. It's just that your power is going to be smaller, but it's going to be the same or worse for other methods. I would think. Okay, I, I think we have one more unanswered question from Peter Stewart about uh, not being able to contact every author. What what's the best we can do with limited time and money. And uh, my take on this would be do publication via staff. But before that, if you cannot contact every author, focus on the most recent publication. So from our experience trying to recover data from people is that if paper is older than five years, publication date, it's very unlikely anybody will even reply to your email. So we would only contact within the last five years. And of course, the more recent paper, the higher chance of success, more likely that uh, the emails will still work and more likely that people will have raw data and they will remember actually the details of their study. So I think that would be the most effective way, really. Uh, just focus on the recent and get whatever you can and do uh, test for publication biases. Okay, I don't know if uh, Yefon or Alfredo would like to add anything to that. Yeah, no, yeah, it's all good. All right, I would okay. suggest- Oh, sorry, there's, yeah, there's a follow-up to that. You mm -hmm. frame to okay. how do I cost out uh, my synthesis time money to understand the trade-offs between cost effectiveness versus complete completeness? Do I have enough resources to do anything sensible at all, you can always do a pilot before you start and try to assess how many papers will be included in your meta-analysis. If they are very few, but you feel you can do more, then you can just broaden the scope of your meta-analysis. And if they are too many, narrow it down, get the question more focused. You can, let's say, focus on a specific taxon or ecosystem, geographic region, so there are many ways of changing the scope of your meta-analysis to keep it within your budget and time frame. So it can go up, it can go down, but it's best to be checked before you start. So we always do a round of piloting and scoping for every meta-analysis or systematic review. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sharing a link to a paper that might help with this piloting. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, okay. If there are no more questions, I think I, I mean, I'm, I'm really a little bit busy uh, checking the three places for questions. Um, there are more questions. I suggest we move on to the tutorial, Yafong, and you lead that, and Lucy yeah. and I can continue looking at the, yeah. uh, taking care of the questions, and we can also uh, answer Carolina's question, original question, with uh, what everything means in the equation, which I totally understand. And uh, also, we can try to tackle Wolfgang's uh, question about the uh, standard yeah, error yeah. and mm -hmm. the intercept. All right, let's get going then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are come to the exciting session, hands-on session. In this session, everyone should be able to have practice uh, using the data we provided here. So uh, this, this uh, what you see is a HTML file, uh, which can be used to uh, provide with you a hands-on guard and a code, uh, and, and you can modify our code to your own data, uh, data sets for your own publication bio test. Uh, our uh, tutorial heavily relies on two papers. The first is coming from uh, Snitch Nakakawa's paper. The second is coming from Wolfgang, uh, is the uh, author of the metaphor package. So if our tutorial ha have helped you some a bit, so please uh, credit the original authors properly. 
uh, the main packages used in this tutorial uh, will be two packages. The first is the metaphor package. I think many of you already heard about this and already used it. This package can be used for, in our tutorial, can be used for effect size calculation and the model fitting. The second package we will use is uh, Ochart plot, which can be used to visualize the model of model results fitted by the metaphor package, which is uh, really very nice. And we randomly select, we randomly collected uh, one publicly available data set as uh, our example to showcase uh, the method to test and adjust for publication bounds. Uh, this is uh, where our data set come from. So the first thing we need to do is uh, load the necessary packages and the process data uh, from the example paper. So we archived our data in the GitHub repository. You should be able to find the, all the data and code in the, uh, in the GitHub repository. Uh, after load the data set, we you will uh, as a, uh, we usually will have a look at the data set. But for this data set, uh, you do not need to worry about uh, the meaning of each, each column because uh, this doesn't matter um, in terms of this tutorial. Uh, before conducting the publication bounds, uh, a, a necessary step is to calculate the effect size and the sampling variance. Here we use the standardized mean differences as our effect, effect size measures. We will use the, uh, this function from metaphor, which is really powerful. This package, uh, this function can be used to calculate almost uh, every very common uh, effect size measure. Here we specify SMD to the augment of, of measure, and then you run all the syntax that you will uh, have all the effect size and uh, some variance. And this column is uh, calculated effect size and this column is, is uh, corresponding sampling variance. Uh, these two variables are the key quantitative uh, variables used for publication bounds test. So the first thing we need to do is test for the publication bounds. There are two uh, publication bounds form. The first is the small study effects. The second is the decline effects. So let's recall the mathematical formulas uh, just uh, for testing publication bounds. So regarding the uh, one question in the last session, and uh, I will explain what is M and what is mu. The so M is is the uh, sampling variance used to account for the sampling variance. I mean, due to the uh, limited sample size in your study, you have to account for the sampling variance. And this term is used to account for the within study uh, random effect. In many fields, uh, for example, ecology evolution, one study probably report more than one effect size. So this will cause the issue of data non-independence. Uh, when testing publication bounds, you need to account for such data non-independence. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, have non-nominal type of an error. Uh, hope I answer your question. And although this formula looks complex, but uh, it is not difficult to contrast this formula using existing knowledge, especially we can use the powerful function from metaphor package. This RMIM uh, uh, function is really powerful. You can use this, this function to fit uh, very complex uh, meta analytical models, including and this formula we used to test the publication bounds. Uh, the first thing you need to do is to add uh, an unique uh, identifier for each row or each effect size. This, uh, this is used to, this is aligned to this term, which is used to account for the data non independence. And then you need to send all the continuous variable to is the interpretation of the intercept. Uh, the first uh, continuous variable you need to center is the publication year because this will be the predictor to test for the decline effect of the time lag bounds. This variable is aligned to this term. And then you need to uh, center the other important uh, moderate variables. In our case, we have two other important variables. The first is the latitude and the second is the longitude. Uh, these terms 
are aligned with uh, this term in the formula, which is used to account for the heterogeneity. And the last variable you need to correct is uh, something uh, standard error, which is used to uh, test for the small study effect. This variable is aligned to this term. And then you, you can uh, construct uh, the model using the, the uh, using this syntax. Uh, you first need to specify the effect size, sampling and variance, and then you organize your random effect structure, uh, which is aligned with this term. And then you specify all the predictors, including the sampling error, publication year, and other important predictors. Uh, after running this model, you will get the model output. Uh, the output is very long, but uh, in terms of publication bug detection, uh, the most important part is here. Uh, this, this section provides all the um, model coefficients of the predictors you fit to the model and the corresponding hypothesis testing. Uh, this rule represents the uh, model results of the small study effect. And this zoo represents the model results of the uh, small study uh, uh, time lag bounds or decline effect. This is the point estimate. This is the stand error. And the test the statistic, degree of freedom, p-value, and the confidence interval. Um, as we said in our presentation, a more proper way is to replace the original uh, sampling error by the modified measure of sampling error. A typical one is the effective sample size based sampling error. And the first thing we need to do is to calculate the effective sample size and then calculate the uh, effect, effective sample size based sampling error and replace it, uh, replace it by the original sampling error. Uh, then we write a help function to calculate the effective sample size based sampling error. Uh, then we calculate it. And then we calculate the, um, we take the square root to, to get the sampling error. And then we specify it to the, uh, as a one of the predictor in the model. And this variable is aligned with uh, this term. And after running this model, you will get the model output. Uh, this is the new test of the small study effect. And uh, after uh, testing the publication bias, the next step we need to do is uh, properly report publication bias results. Uh, we see that uh, in the model output, we see the, mm, the model slope uh, beta two, which is the effect of the publication year is not statistically significant. Uh, this indicates there is no strong evidence of decline effects. But uh, if we uh, visualize the um, uh, model results, we can find some different results. Uh, here we use uh, the bubble plot function from OCHAT plot to visualize it. And this is the syntax to uh, visualize the pub publication bias test results. Then we will get the, uh, this bubble plot showing the relationship between publication year and the uh, effect size magnitude. We can see there is a slightly negative uh, temporal trait in effect size magnitude. Um, but remember, in our publication bias test result, we did not find any statistical significance of the publication year. But actually, the Point estimate of the slope point uh, beta two is minus zero point zero five eight. Uh, if I mean, if uh, as the time is going after ten years, this the magnitude of the effect size will uh, decrease to zero point five eight, which is quite large. Is it is equivalent to a median size or effect size. So if we only focus on the dichotomous. Uh, reporting of the publication bias test, uh, 
you will uh, neglect the importance of evidence for the existing of decline factor. Actually, in this case, in this example, the uh, effect size is declining over time. A, si a similar interpretation can be applied to the test of a small study effect. The model slope of the sampling error is, statist is statistically significant. I can show you here, yeah. We can see the p-value is statistically significant and the point estimate is quite large. Uh, once we use the bubble plot function to visualize it, we can see there is a clear evidence of small study effect. This is a kind of visual check with a confirmation of the publication bias test. Mm, so uh, if you find the a small study effect in your data set, you really need to interpret your results and conclusion with caution. Uh, you also can use some uh, traditional final plot to uh, examine the small study effect of the asymmetry of the final plot. Uh, we can use the final function from um, metaphor package. This is a typical final plot, which can be made by the uh, metaphor package. You can see obviously this final plot is asymmetric. Here is empty. So after just after uh, finding the publication bias, the next step you need to do is to correct for such a publication bias to see whether your result is robust and uh, whether uh, you need to uh, be careful about uh, your evidence. So this is the formula to uh, adjust for the publication bias, and which is very similar to the above one. The only difference is replace the sampling error by the sampling variance. And this is the whole syntax to contrast this model. After fitting this model, let's have a look at the model output. Uh, you might still remember for this formula, the parameter of interest is the intercept beta zero here because it can be interpreted as the true effect or we call it uh, both corrected overall effect. When we look at this intercept here, we see the true effect or population level effect is still uh, statistically significant, although the magnitude decreased a little bit. So from this perspective, although this uh, data set has some sort of small data effect, but the evidence is still robust. And if we compare the bias correction uh, overall effect to the original effect, we can see this is a table showing the compar comparison between the original one, naive one, and the bias correction one. The, actually, the magnitude indeed decreased, but uh, it is still robust in terms of the um, statistical significance. Okay, so a uh, next step, I think you m might want to try your own analysis using our um, uh, code provided by in the GitHub repository. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more about the publication bias test, you can uh, read our recent published methodological paper in methodological evolution. And in this paper, we summarized the cousin practice of the publication bias test and uh, a deeper explanation of the method we proposed. Uh, and as we illustrated here in this tutorial. Okay, so Alfredo, to next, uh, shall we start the practice? It's actually a very good question from Peter on the Q&A that I think uh, you could try to answer your phone. Yeah, um, we are. If you we can are trying to find. In the Q&A. Uh... Uh, we are in, okay, Q&A. Yeah, just... This one does the use of effective sample size. Do you mean this question? Very good point by Peter. Okay, does the use of it mean one does not include?
Okay, so using the instructive sample size to replace the uh, traditional sampling error is the way to, um, I mean, for some type of effect size, when you calculate the sampling error, in the formula of the sampling error, there is a point estimate of the effect size. So this means there is a natural relationship between the sampling error and the point estimate of the effect size. So this will increase the possibility of your publication bias test. But for some other effect size, there is no this kind of natural relationship. In such a case, you can still use standard error as the predictor to detect the publication bias. But if in the formula of the sampling error, there is a point estimate of the uh, effect size in the formula of the sampling error, you is better use the effective sample size based the sampling error as the predictor to test the publication bias. Otherwise, you will get a nominal type one error rate. Hope I answer your question. Maybe just a small clarification. In principle, yes, but it depends on what effect size you are using. Yeah. So mm. if you are using correlation, in principle, we don't advise to use the effective sample size. But if you are using the standardized mean different a standard sorry a standardized means difference or the log response ratio, uh, then is when we recommend to use the effective sample size. And you can see there that uh, in principle you would be you would get away without the uh, standard deviations. Yeah. But not for the estimation of the effect size per se, perhaps, unless for, than for the um, log response ratio, mm -hmm. you don't use any correction. So if you don't use any correction for the log response ratio, sorry, let me try to rephrase it. You don't use any correction for the log response ratio and a correction for a small sample size, and then you go ahead and use the effective sample size, I, I believe you could get away by not using the standard error. I haven't thought about this question, so I'm not 100% uh, whether, that's why I also added the, the paper that whether it's, uh, it would be the case, but I think you could get away with it. So it's a good point that I would like to think far to myself. Hope that helps, but uh, please uh, make sure to add any follow-up. We are using log response ratio. I think it could be, but I mean, that that requires that you're not using any um, correction for the log response ratio. Yeah. So you're just using really the response of the two ratios in the log, which I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I cannot really say more than what I just said. But certainly something I'm gonna think about myself. Uh, any more questions in the Slack? Nothing. Twitter. Twitter is now doesn't seem to be very um, popular, which is good. And we use the other ones, the other channels. Any more questions so far? I mean, this is a lot of information, so it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, we totally understand, but please do not hesitate to try to say, what is that, what is this? Uh, and then we try to clarify, because later on you can use all the material, but if we can clarify mm -hmm. some potentially small things that are really not clear uh, now, it's gonna be beneficial. Uh, so yeah, just go ahead uh, with whatever random question you may have or something that is not clear, please. Or you can have practice, and if you have any questions, we can may address your question. Wolfgang, if you're still there and uh, you would like to uh, give yourself uh, um, some information about your question, uh, I'm sure you have an answer better than us. Please feel free to do it. Then we clarify and we all profit. Um, we said we were going to talk during the tutorial, but
Otherwise, uh, I think our cells are going to remain quiet and wait for your questions, hoping you're working on your own data or our data. Okay, I see, Wolfen. So the standard error is actually smaller for the bias adjusted estimate. Uh, so you, we can hear, we can see here. Yeah, true. So it goes from all twenty-two to all twenty. Um, is this surprising? Perhaps uh, no, given Taylor's law. Uh, but maybe I'm going too far there. Mm -hmm. So because the mean is going down, the variance is. Also, but no, nah, it probably doesn't apply here. Maybe your phone you could look while the while folks are working on their data. Maybe you could look into if you can have access to our uh, recent publication. Uh, and, yeah. And, and see and see see if you can see a pattern of whether standard errors become smaller for the adjusted. Uh, um, you mean FX Wolfgang's question? You mean what? I mean Wolfgang's question? What yeah, is, exactly, what exactly. If you could look into your data and the data we use for the BMC biology paper, and look okay, at okay. the original yeah. estimates with their standard <laughs> errors, and then come see if the bias corrected ones tend to have the standard errors, if they if they okay. tend to be larger or smaller, then maybe we can at least have a, 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 a practical um, answer here. Because... Mm -hmm. mm, good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, will, I, will, I definitely I will check whether this is the case. Yeah, this is a good point, Wolfgang. Um, yes, yes. Well, thank but, you, uh, So is, the, is the, your phone, is the original estimate, the model from where you get the original estimate, does it include the same moderators or is a unimoderator model? Uh, in, in our BMC biology paper, we did not have any other moderators because, uh, we, because we don't know which moderators, moderators were used by the original author. So... We only include the publication year and the sampling error as predictors when adjusting for the publication. Yeah, error. Uh, true, true. But per default, those are two moderators that are absorbing heterogeneity and reducing the standard error, as uh, Wolf can suggest. Because the model. So it's actually a very good point. Because you cannot have, basically, we are comparing two models, uh, one that has Let at least think. two moderators, two estimates less. So yeah, that yeah. could be the reason why the standard error goes down. Okay, I see, I see Wolfgang's points. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take a note and I will investigate it later. We really you, need to take note of that. And there are more questions, open questions. Yeah. There are questions on, on Slack as well. Regarding uh, the formula. Slack, okay. Yeah. Is this like a supercharged version of the Pet PC. Well, I don't know how you pronounce that. Okay, so I can I can tackle the second question. So I, I cannot really say if it is a supercharged version of the PET PC. Um, this is basically like a regression, a regression version of uh, of the Egger regression, in, in a sense that is a we are making use of multi-level meta-analysis or multi-level meta-regression to, to do it here. So that, that allows us to account for heterogeneity and to model it. So that for data sets that are heterogeneous, as it is pretty much all the data sets in ecology and evolution, and I believe in other fields, you also find quite good levels of heterogeneity. We are trying to create this method that is robust to the, the presence of this heterogeneity. For the second question, why are we using VI instead of SEI? The idea is that um, uh, or in, at the beginning, you're going to be using the uh, standard error, so the sampling standard error, as your predictor to test if there is any evidence of asymmetry. 
any evidence of uh, small study effects. Shall you find statistically significant a statistically significant effect of this moderator, so the standard error? It has been shown by simulations that then the best way to not lead to uh, uh, biased uh, estimates for the intercept is that you run the model with the sampling variance instead. So this is why we are suggesting you have to use first one and then the other one. This is based on simulations. It's uh, actually in our original paper in the methods in ecology and evolution, we, we cite the, I believe two papers that suggest or show that if you don't do that, when the effect is statistically significant with the standard error, you will get a, I believe a down, yeah, down, yeah, well, down, down bias, bias or an underestimate, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah underestimate. Uh, so no, that's no. simply based on uh, simulation data, and that's why we suggest you first do it with the standard error, the sampling standard error, and then you move on to the sampling variance if you actually find evidence. Hopefully, that helps uh, someone. Uh, there is a hard a huddle is happening. I don't even know what that is, to be honest. It could be somebody started by mistake. Okay. If you have yeah. any questions, I think it's better to write them here to not add another extra layer of complexity for answering the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, no questions. Yeah, I, I was just checking our BMC biology paper because we have DOI for it, but it doesn't link anywhere. So it's been accepted, but it doesn't seem to be published. We can add yeah, the, yeah, we yeah. the link to the preprint. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a preprint on Echo Evo Archive with links to GitHub and everything if somebody is interested in looking at that paper. So we can post that link to the preprint for now if people are interested checking it out as well. It's, is it okay? Your phone, Alfredo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was sorry, I was answering a question, so I could not pay attention. I, uh, sorry, should we post a link to preprint of a BMC biology paper? Because the paper is not out on the live on, on the journal website. I, I cannot find idea. it. I think it's a yeah, good idea. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's... Uh... Echo Evo archive. I just put it on the questions okay. on Slack and also here if I can post. Yeah, Peter, Peter has a very good question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I kind of answered it, so maybe mm -hmm. it disappeared now. Okay, so the link to the preprint is now available on uh -uh. the Slack. Uh, we yeah, can also I add it, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just try to type as answer to one of the questions in the uh, question and answer on Zoom. Um, the print, oh. Is anybody actually trying yeah. to run the tutorial? Uh, if you are and you get stuck, drop questions and we will we'll do our best.
Yeah, Peter, Peter's question is very good. <laughs> we need to consult with Smith <laughs> to see whether whether the imputed sampling error can be the predictor of the small study effect. Maybe someone is writing a question on Slack, perhaps. But, but can, can you yep. circulate? I did not find a question. Oh, good question. Great Dosage question. or time follow ups as moderators? Um, I mean, yeah, so would this work with meta analysis where we use dosage or time follow ups as moderators? That's uh, Samuel's question on Slack. I am not sure why it could not work, uh, but I, as long as they are moderators, you could uh, include them in the model to account for heterogeneity and see if uh, there is still evidence of publication bias, uh, both the clan effects and small study effects, after you've explained some of the heterogeneity that those two moderators uh, might explain. But given that I have never used something like those short time follow-ups, I don't know if they have any special feature that would make this different. I don't know if uh, Lucy and your phone have any other comments or if you want to reward or clarify that. In principle, it should be possible with any moderator as, uh, as long as I can see. As long as moderators that you think so, uh, that might explain some of the heterogeneity you find in the original meta intercept only meta analysis. Can you pass this question to me? Uh, circulate this question. Yeah, it's on the Slack. I'll write it on the on the chat in, here in the Zoom. Okay, yeah. For you. Just you a sec. In the All chat, right. can you send it white chat? I'll put it on right now on the chat for you, only for the panelists. Okay, the, the, I mean, for all the continuous variable, you just need to center them and put them as a predict one of the predictor in the meta analysis model. It doesn't matter whether it is dosage or time follow up, as long as it is a continuous variable. Uh, I think the complication here is that they, they are likely to be like uh, auto correlated. So, you know, those are not independent points. Like, it's not like you have, let's say, different levels of proteins in the diet or different drug levels, but those are with, with time at least, yes? They are like subsequent measurements. So you have kind of extra level of non-independence that you need to model. Yes, the, the principle is if you I mean, worry about the non-independence between different uh, dosage or time follow-up, you can use multivariant meta-analysis model to model this kind of data non-independence. At the but you still can add the sampling error as one of the predictor to test the small study effect. So th this doesn't matter as long as you think the variable of interest is the important uh, moderate. You should put them into the model. There's another interesting question that I would like to answer. Actually. Uh is do you have a, an explanation for why effect sizes can decrease over time? So, Yifong, uh, I'm just going to mm -hmm. stop your sharing and I'm going to share some slides that I have for yeah. this. Yeah. Um, if I can, here. So, anonymous attendee, I hope you can see my my slides now. Yeah, and, yeah, I can, we can see. Okay, I'm kind of trying to find my way on my screens. So there are multiple reasons why we can find these decline effects. And here I'm going to just show three examples. What could be a, a true change over time? Imagine, imagine you're measuring something like antibiotic resistance. And what you observe is that there is like uh, resistance is increasing over time. Um, so if you, if you wouldn't have thought that that can happen, then you would see a decline in effect sizes that is just driven by this resistance. So this is like a true change biologic of, of biological interest in this case. Mm -hmm. This is rarely the case, but it's a possibility. Um, another one could be simply due to uh, changes in methodology that you might yeah. or might not be aware. So 
think I had a, I don't know, I don't have the example here. I, imagine so imagine a, a a topic for when after a few years of study, yeah, Lucia. I have, I think I have example, like imagine animal studies, like when we look at biomedical studies from like 50 years ago, they did really horrible things to animals, like, you know, chopping off legs and other parts of brains and other things. But over time, because of uh, cons ethical concerns, they, there were lots of restrictions what you can do to animals. So there was also technological improvements, what you can do. Mm -hmm. So all those manipulations became much more subtle, precise and subtle. So I think because of that, you will also see smaller effects because just what we can do uh, in terms of ethics and uh, technology. Okay, so that's like a practical example. Mm. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, I had another example with the methodology where basically they changed. Uh, it's actually in this Korycheva and Kulinskaya, where they basically started studying animals in islands. So the first studies were on mainlands, and then they study animals on islands. And there was actually a difference between the hypothesis in the islands and the and the mainland. So they ended up with having a decline in the effect that was driven simply because they changed what they were studying. But yeah, I think it's a very good example. Those is much better. Uh, and then what we normally assume with this decline effects is that it's because of systematic bias. Assume, and I mean assume because sometimes we cannot really know for true, for, for real. Um, we need to explore multiple potential explanations, uh, let's say methodological or uh, consider true changes, and then realize that it's likely going to be a systematic bias. So often it is the case, uh, what we call the winner's course, where the authors are uh, the, the first published um test of the hypothesis are simply the consequence of somebody finding by chance the honeypot. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you say it like that in English, um, where they by chance find uh, a support for the hypothesis. Normally that's going to be uh, based on small sample sizes and then they get it published normally in a good journal or at least in the past in a good journal. And then people after that try to uh, uh, replicate that uh, hypothesis and they don't find evidence or uh, the evidence uh, is not as strong as uh, it was originally. Um, other times it could be that publishing negative effects or statistically non-significant effects uh, may take longer, either because uh, you don't actually make the effort of trying to publish it and you take a longer time to, to put time on trying to publish it or because uh, journals, meaning editors and reviewers are gonna, yeah, push backwards. Like uh, you're gonna take a longer time to convince them. So your test, even if you did them, let's say in 2005, you may not publish them until 2010 and there's a delay. And that's why we could potentially see these decline effects, etc. So um, there are multiple reasons, basically. That's what I wanted. Again, I'll say, I don't know if I lose your phone, you have any more examples or reasons, but those are the three I had in mind. Actually, we have a common paper in, in, on this topic, but let me try to find it. Okay, there are more questions. Okay, the question from Peter, uh, shall I read it? So in our data set, we have long-term agronomic trials. Perhaps crop yield is reported across multiple publications, but it is all from the same experiment. Does this create non-independence that give me another headache? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Whether it gives you a headache, uh, I mean, it depends on the structure of your data set. You could potentially account for that. For as long as you are able to know if the effect sizes come from the same population or experiment, you could try to model that uh, through yeah. uh, the multi-level meta-analysis. So having as a random effect population or experiment, and then you could even potentially uh, yeah go fancier and rather than using sampling variance, a vector of sampling uh, variance uh, to weight effect sizes, you could even model a matrix 
that does not assume that the uh, random effects are independent um, or all the effect sizes coming from each population or experiment. I don't think it's a too much of a big uh, headache as long as you are comfortable with multi-level meta-analysis. But yeah, it's a level of complexity you have to account for. Yeah, so so there are actually some meta-analysis and also methodological paper using lab ID as as a, you know one level of non-independence. And mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it does. If yeah. you have like one lab dominating most of your data set, you certainly want to take it into account when interpreting your results or if possible statistically as well, controlling for. And they are likely to use similar methods, similar sites. So definitely results from the same lab are not going to be independent. It's always good to use multi-level structure to account for, I mean, potential non-independence in your data set, even though your data set doesn't have any uh, non-independence, the result will be similar to the normal random effects model. So you will lose nothing. Yeah, you can find out that it doesn't matter. You know, you account for this or not, but it doesn't make a difference, but it may make a difference. So it's good to check. And uh, it's good to pick, keep kind of, you know, be careful there when you're extracting data and spot those patterns. Oh yeah, there's a lot of paper from this place and this place. Mm -hmm. And actually another thing, it's good to extract data together from the same lab and same area. It, you can kind of spot inconsistencies and also kind of fill in the details. You see, okay, this was definitely done around the same time, same people, and they miss this detail in this paper, but they report it in the other. You can cross, cross fill the gaps between publications just because people usually don't report everything. There is also another question on Slack that I'm trying to answer, um, but I will leave it there on Slack. I think we don't need to read it potentially. <laughs> um, Someone let us know if that kind of helps, and if not, we, we try to tackle it. Yeah. All right, are uh, there more questions? So Twitter is still empty. Slack, I believe we tackled everything. Soon. And so far, nothing. Okay, so we are still here for any questions that may arise. Particularly if you are playing with the data and you have any, yeah, any questions, we are, we are here doing our best. Yeah. Another question on the Q&A. Are you also partially adjusting for positive publication bias by using the metarogression method, the asymmetry mentioned, or did I miss something? What exactly do you mean by positive publication bias? Okay, can you copy the question in the chat? Ah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. in the Q&A here on, this, on the Zoom. But I can't copy I would, it. No. I, I did okay. copy it. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. By using the uh, Okay. I mean, the positive sign. What, what, are, what is the positive publication bar? 
I mean, I, I'm assuming you just mean uh, public, like uh, small study effects. Mm. Uh, the fact that uh, there is there are missing uh, non-statistically significant effects or even effects that go okay. against. In such a case, in such a case, uh, our I mean, our convention is still to adjust for this kind of uh, bias because uh, the custom method to detect the publication bias is, I mean, the power is very low. You 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 didn't find the, the publication bias, but there is still maybe publication bias because of the low power of the detection method. You couldn't find them. So it is always good to correct for such a bias, if possible. Yeah, but in principle, that's precisely what we you will be adjusting for. That's yeah. the idea that you the the effect size, this adjusted effect size, which uh, corresponds to normally the intercept of this uh, model, will be adjusted by the the small study effects after you have included in the in your model uh, the either the sampling standard error or the sampling variance. So yeah, in principle, that's what we suggest. Uh, yeah. I actually there is a comment on Twitter by uh, Gavin Stewart. He has a very good point. Uh, he says, "I wish I could join. Test and report definitely adjust for is more controversial. I'd set that for include potential for distortion distortion in decision making. And it is true that I mean whenever we try to adjust for publication bias." we have to keep in mind that uh, it is a difficult task. It is an estimate because we actually don't know what happened. Yeah. When we find the uh, evidence for publication bias, we just find potential evidence for publication bias. We cannot really know how many effect sizes are somewhere unpublished and the reasons why. So you should always keep in mind that these adjusted effect sizes are estimates. It yeah. doesn't mean that the, the, the true effect size once we've adjusted for publication bias, is that. Now, this is just a potential estimate that accounts for the evidence that we found for it. And it kind of normally uh, brings down the amount of evidence for the hypothesis, sort of say. Yeah, that's um, true. I don't know if that helps. There's one more question from Peter. Is there a off the rack function or vignette regarding how to create labs from ORCID or author names? Not that I know of myself. Do you, Yefong and Losia know how, if there's some kind of R package that allows you to, uh, I'm assuming having a data set uh, reference with all the references including in your meta-analysis to try to fetch or scrap uh, ORCID or org ID oh. uh, websites in, so that you can automatically generate a lab ID uh, variable as a random effect? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant uh, question. Uh, so one thing to do would be at the moment, like I think what's most R friendly, I find a uh, lens uh, database, which is uh, not lens, sorry, uh, open Alex, it's a new one. It has an R package. It doesn't have web interface, but it's R friendly. So you can connect the search there for the papers. And uh, it has quite a lot of bibliometric information about the authors. Uh, institutional information, it's usually very messy. So it's probably best just to do a network analysis of author names and see if you can see any clusters, like people that appear repeatedly and connect publications into a clusters. So, so co-authorship network basically, and then use those co-authorship clusters or where they co-author many papers together, which means it's likely to be the same lab and try to use it as a, a one of the moderators. Yeah, so it's, it's something that people have, I think people started thinking about, but usually they do it manually. I guess for small data data sets it's okay, but if you have a really big one, uh, automating it will be yeah will be something good to try. Yeah, I, actually I can show you something. There are indeed one paper uh, on this topic, but this paper, 
uh, did not provide any archive to identify the cause uh, clusters. This paper used uh, the uh, MATLAB, I think, yeah, MATLAB. So at the moment, the archive solution we did not have. So we only can do it manually to collect the author ID or something. Okay. Any more questions? We still have a couple of minutes before we have to say bye bye. Yeah. Um, today, I feel like I would profit from having four screens rather than two. Thanks, Peter, for all the questions. We're very active. <laughs> I'm sure now I'm on screen again. Black still empty. I'm assuming Twitter too. Yeah. Uh, Lucia, can you provide yep. the the Slack channel in the chat? Because some Peter is asking. Okay. This Slack channel. Thank you. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you need, Peter, you need to browse uh, on Slack. If you go channels and uh, go to manage, so like open the little like triangle on the right from the channels, go to manage it, and then you will see browse channels. And you should join a channel questions for presenters. Okay, there are only five channels altogether, but you need to choose that one questions for presenters. And this is the one used for all sessions where you can ask questions. Ah, there are more questions, no? Uh -huh. Wolfgang, okay. What is there? Why did you not use the alternative method of uh, computing? Since with this, you get a really strong inherent. Uh, I, I, I'm, I guess uh, Wolfgang is talking about the example, the specific ex example that you use your phone in your <laughs> tutorial. Did you, yeah, okay. you didn't use the uh, effective sample size, I'm assuming? Um, okay. So uh, actually, we showed this method. We used the alternative method to compute the sample variance in the tutorial. I think we... Could we didn't use both? Uh, I, I cannot yeah. remember from the top of my head. Okay, I can show... Uh, but not in figure two, at least. Uh, figure two. Yeah, I, I had... Uh, actually, I had this... Um, but I deleted this, actually. <laughs> in previous version, I had this in figure two. Uh, alternative method to compute the sampling error for the figure two. But I want to put this tutorial as simple as possible. So I deleted that figure, actually. Yeah, but I think Wolfgang has a good point because also for the adjusted uh, effect, it seems that we did not use the effective sample size. Uh, 
so that's something we should perhaps update if that's the case. Because yeah, we are using, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank so that you. Maybe it's something we should update. Yeah, good yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, everybody with the GitHub link will get access to this updated one so that they know how to do it actually with the effective sample size, which is the method we suggest. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank well you. Spotted. Yeah. Eagle eye. We had this in Paris version, but I deleted them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good spotting. Thank you. I think we have to get going. Are there any last questions? Wolfgang is very I see. So Wolfgang is already doing the uh, the updated uh, <laughs> GitHub. Maybe pull request and we up update it. Yeah, actually, and... we, we we borrowed a uh, lots of stuff from Wolfgang's pack metaphor package. So, which is really... yeah, but he's finding that the adjusted effect then becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I mean. I cannot really say why then. Is there a stat Wolfgang, is there a st statistically significant effect or a statistically significant evidence of um, small study effects when using the effective sample size or? Yes, yeah, th this can happen because um, we did not account for enough heterogeneity because we did not get the, the full list of the uh, moderate variables, actually. So the beta zero can go up, also can can go up and also can go down. Yeah, I cannot think about it uh, now without looking at the data. So this actually, this because there are lots of the, uh, categorical, categorical moderate variables, we need to put uh, them into the model. Then we will estimate the marginalized mean, I mean, as the bias character effect. Uh, but since we, we, we are not able to collect uh, the full list of the moderate variables, so the beta zero probably is not the real effect size, I mean, the true effect size or population effect size. So it's just uh, approximate. It yeah, can go up and also can go down. I think I know what you mean, your phone. I think we should, uh, so because we have to leave it here, I think we should uh, update the, Git, the GitHub, uh, the, the tutorial, and then provide a bit of an explanation, written explanation on the Slack channel for everybody so that they, they can read it too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good point. I think that would be the best. And then Wolfgang can also, uh, comment afterwards, uh, yeah. and we can have yeah. a chat about it. Uh, which I yeah. think is a very, very important point. And now, kind of, yeah, we are running out of time. I hope that's okay, Wolfgang, and and all. Um, we gotta leave it here. Uh, before we leave it, um, yeah, just to close the session. Um, uh, that's it for this workshop. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope we, it was useful. We did our best uh, to answer your questions. I'm sure there are more questions. Um, if you need any extra help, so I think we can continue talking on the Slack channel and we'll do our best within our possibilities, time constraints involved and to answer them. And we'll see you at the next session. Uh, we have a, an amazing week ahead. Uh, the schedule is packed and full of uh, exciting talks and workshops and webinars and whatnot.